this video we are going to discuss section 1310. This is Lagrange, Lagrange, multipliers, however you pronounce it. Um, I'm going to talk about the idea and do an example in this video, um, and then we'll have a second video that we'll do two more examples. Um, this method is fantastic. It's brilliant that somebody even thought about this, and it's so simple that I'm like, oh, I, how did I not see that? Um, so I'm going to do my best to try to get this idea across to you. Um, you may have to watch this a few times and then may have to wrestle your brain to, to be able to understand what's going on. I'd really encourage you to sit and really try to understand why. Um, this one is totally uh, graspable, if that's a word. You can grasp this. Um, okay, so let's start with a function. And um, we are still wa working for optimization given a constraint. So the function in red on the left, just some function, we call it z, right? The output is z, it may be an x squared plus y squared, it may be some kind of function like we have seen. And then in the orange color, we have a constraint, a totally different curve um, that's equal to c. Now, the difference here is this z on the left is a like expression, it's the output. The c on the right over here is a constant. So with that, um, this is a surface. So our function, right, two variables, x, y, spits out a z, gives me a surface. And then the constraint, and, and this may be a little more difficult to see, but if we take like x squared plus y squared, and that's my function, and I set it equal to a 6 or something, I get a level curve. This is that like slice that we can take out of our surface. It'll create a two-dimensional curve or a level curve. Um, so a level curve to um, a surface, and that surface is the g there to a surface g of x, y, z. All right, so we have a function, which is our surface. Um, I drew a contour map of just some type of function there um, to make sure you understand what the contour map is. We have talked about it this semester, but we have different levels there of our contour map, right? That um, this one looks like it's a valley, c equals one, c equals 10, c equals 20, and c equals 100. It's like going up around the sides. Um, or we could think about it the other way. Let's talk about maybe the peak is in the middle. We changed our C's. I did some C's to help you understand there. Um, now, we put this in the XY plane. It's flat. And we can see all these level curves. And I didn't write all the level curves. We can't do that, right? There's an infinite number of level curves. But we just picked some kind of pattern. Mine's random. I just wanted to show you the different change. Now, if this constraint is a level curve, right? It's a slice, a two-dimensional slice out of a three-dimensional surface. So it has some kind of level curve, and I'm going to put this here. Here's my level curve. We'll call this g. g of x, y, not just equal to z, but equal to that constant c. So imagine this. You have a contour map, and, and think about a three-dimensional surface, and you have all these different levels for the contour, and then we have this g, x, y equals c that lives at some c. At some point, if I draw the correct level curve, this orange curve is just a surface will hit some level curve or some contour curve there. It will hit it dead on. Now, if I think about the surface itself, um, the this would be, if I look on the orange here, everything past it is going to be above it. Like all this here and here will be above this point here. That's what the contour map says, the red graph, right? So if we're looking at the constraint there, it is actually everything below that on the red curve will be below that constraint, or uh, above it, rather, because the contours are going up as I go this way, uh, to the right, as I go out. So that orange curve will hit an exact line there, and that will be the max because everything, or the minimum in this case, because everything here will be on those curves. It will be higher in the red. It's higher than the orange curve. So the lowest point there will be where we meet here. Now, this intersection, since that's the case, this intersection, let's write this in, the intersection intersection gives the constrained, so that's everything on that orange graph, the intersection between the orange graph and the red graph will give me a constrained max or min. Sorry for my handwriting there. A constrained max or min. Now, cool, great. How do I find that point then? I know it exists, right? 
Well, if I have a point there, um, and hopefully you can see this, but they should have the same type of tangent line. Why I say type of is that the tangent line should be some constant multiple. They will have parallel tangent lines because that's a they meet at a point, so they share the tangent line. They only share one point, so the tangent line at that point will be shared between the two. Now, it will be a multiple, meaning they're parallel, but they may not be the same size. Now, since the tangent lines, let's write this out, tangent lines Tangent lines are constant multiples of each other here in this case. Well, if that's the case, and we learned this earlier, if the tangent lines are constant multiples or parallel, that's what that definition means, then we have that the normals of the level curves, labor, level curves, don't know why I said that, uh, level curves are scalar multiples, meaning they are parallel. Now, what does that give us? Well, let's write out an equation here. So the normal of F is equal We'll put this in parentheses. The normal of f is equal to some constant k times the normal of g. Now, in the past section, so hopefully you're already seeing this, we actually know how to find a normal um, given a point. The, the normal to a point of a curve is our gradient. So f x y equals some constant k times some gradient, the gradient of g. Why this is fantastic is that this actually applies to three dimensions too. Um, we can just extend this to XYZ. Now, when we were doing the constrained problem, uh, the optimization with constraints, um, before this section, we were having to do it in XY. Like the problems towards the end of the section, we were having to convert X, Y, and Z to just some X, Y somehow. Um, in this case, it's going to apply directly. This Instead of doing the gradient of XY, we do the gradient of XY and Z. So let me write out, um, they actually have a name for this uh, K. They like to call it okay, F of XY equals, and they use lambda. Lambda times the gradient of G of XY. So what I was saying a second ago, what's great about this is this is going to apply to XYZ as well. So we actually get both of these. Now, how this is going to help is we're going to be able to find both gradients, solve for a lambda, and then this is going to help us find the points that the, the max or min that we are looking for. Let's do an example to clear this up. All right, so it says find the extreme of that with a constraint, and they gave me that this is a level curve of that function that I underlined at 6. So I'm going to write both functions here. F, X, Y is equal, uh, is equal to X, Y. And then my g function here is going to be equal to 2x plus 3y. That is that function. I know that if I take the gradient of f, it's going to be equal to some lambda, some number times the gradient of g. I have that. So I need to find the gradient. So gradient of xy, right? Remember the gradient is fx comma fy, and it is a vector, because remember it gives me the direction of the quickest way out, or the steepest incline. So I need fx, okay, well, the partial derivative of f with respect to x is y. The partial of f with respect to y is x. So I have that. Then I take my gradient of g, and take my partials there. I get 2, 3. So now I can set this equation up. yx is equal to some lambda times 2, 3. Well, I know component y's have to be equal. So I'm going to do y equals lamb, uh, 2 lambda. We'll call it 2, put the 2 out front. 2 lambda, and then x equals 3 lambda. Well, at this point, you do anything that you have to do to solve for lambda. Well, I have an equation they gave me. They gave me that 2x plus 3y 
equals six. This will be the simplest uh, way to solve for lambda. So I'm just going to plug everything in. I got two times three lambda plus three times two lambda, and that equals six. All right, that is six lambda plus six lambda equals six, which means we get 12 lambda equals six, and then that means uh, that is equal to one half. So what's great now is I can actually find my points where this minimum or maximum may occur. So to get my point, I know x is equal to three times lambda, which is one half. So three halves is x. Y is equal to two times lambda, which is one half. And two times lambda is one. So we have a critical point at three, two, one. Now, to find if this is a max or min, we would have to run this through our second partials test. Um, if you have two points, and we'll have one in the next examples, uh, I'll have an example of this in the next two examples, but um, if you have two points, it's easy. The small point is the minimum, the big point is the maximum. I do need to figure out what that actual value is, so I can plug that in, three, two, three over two, one. If I plug that into my function, I get three over two. So it's a max or a min, we don't know, we'd have to check of three, two. I'm not gonna use the video to do this because we did this in the last section um, and we don't wanna watch video, we don't have to. So you would just plug this into, right, the D, A, B, and remember this was F, X, X times F, Y, Y minus F, X, Y squared. Sorry for the bad handwriting there, but there's the reminder of our formula that works here. Um, just check out the last section video and you can find out how to do that.